Isabel, what vocal mic should I buy? This has got to be the most common question I'm asked by my students and podcast listeners, hands down. And I get it. Investing in a mic can feel like a big deal. There's so many options to choose from now and everyone you ask will give you a different recommendation. What's a girl to do? And that's why I've created a quick, easy 45 second quiz where you'll be matched with your perfect vocal mic. You'll tell me about your voice, your setup, your needs and your budget and I'll pair you with a vocal mic that's your perfect fit. No more trawling through the internet, scrolling through thousands of online reviews and losing all sense of time and space. And did I mention you'll even receive a free bonus video I recorded in my very own home studio showing you how to position your mic for your best sounding recordings yet. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz and get your hands on all of this. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz and get ready to meet your perfect vocal mic. There's a wonderful um, electronic musician artist called Christina Kubisch. Uh, she's German. She, in the uh, 1970s, is creating these beautiful, funny pieces, okay, which she has this whole series called Vibrations, and she's using vibrators, <laughs> and she's wow. actually putting them kind of on the string of the cello. You know, she has a, a, a string quartet for, um, you know, two violins, cello viola like a normal string quartet plus four vibrators (laughs) and they have to be kind of sized specifically wow that's great Um, yeah it's like a a send-up you know of like 1960s drone music yeah yeah so she's kind of subverting again those traditions with like a lot of wit and humor but it's so smart and she's not afraid to be funny hello and welcome to girls twiddling knobs My name's Isabel, and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female-identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Well, a very happy New Year, Knob Twiddlers. Well, just about. We are on New Year's Eve, but you may be listening to this episode once 2021 has started. And I'm so thrilled to be ringing in the New Year with you here on the Girls Twiddling Knobs podcast and wanted to do something a little bit special So invited along a lady I just know you're going to love just as much as I do. She's called Gassia Ozunian and she's a professor of music at Oxford University as well as one of the warmest human beings I have ever met. Um, She literally badgered me for years to be on the radio and I said, well, Gassia, that may be out of my control, but here I am hosting a podcast. So she was very excited when she learned that. Um, She was also one of my PhD supervisors when she lectured at the Sonic Arts Research Centre and has a fascinating knowledge of experimental music and sonic arts. So I asked her to share her top women from music tech history to inspire us stepping into 2021. And boy, did she deliver. I think you're going to love hearing her talk about these inspiring ladies and what they added to the fields of sound, music and more. But before we begin, if you're looking to do something fun this New Year's Eve, I highly recommend taking my quiz, Discover Your Female Producer Spirit Guide. Which production goddess will be guiding you through 2021? Find out at femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz. Okay, let's get into this week's episode and raise a toast to these incredible, inspiring women in music tech history. I'm delighted to have you on the New Year's Eve episode. Yay! Um, And I am going to pop my fizz now. And I just had a glug, a glug of wine. Oh, good. (laughs) Oh, there we go. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, I uh, I had to go for some fizz because um, so good. It's New Year's Eve. Yes, you know? absolutely. 
And yeah. I love that you're kind of decked out in there with this, uh, the nice acoustic paneling yes. and the foam and, mm. oh my God, I love the type. I love the name so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's perfect. You. It's perfect. <laughs> I love the image that goes with it. I had to obviously use a pun. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I started listening. It's so wonderful. It's oh. so wonderful and interesting and I read some of the reviews and, you know, uh, people, you know, just saying how kind of honest it is. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, really something that comes through. I love how, you know, open you are about just all your experiences and the kind of highs and lows. Um, and I love what you say about, um, you know, that no one was coming. I thought that was quite powerful that you mm -hmm. realized as you were kind of building this career and uh, the music industry that yeah. it wasn't at all how you expected that it would go yeah um, but I also thought that's a really kind of powerful idea actually this thing that no one is coming you know totally yeah. like for lots of different parts of our lives right totally um I mean it's scary and also really liberating at the same time I agree I, yeah. I think once you kind of you know figure that out yeah it's it's actually quite empowering because mm -hmm. you realize it's it's kind of all up to you and yeah. um and uh yeah in a way that's a kind of empowering i think feeling to yeah to just mm -hmm. kind of yeah i think like actually i'm in charge and anyhow yeah. I'm, I'm just so delighted that uh you're doing this oh thank you well um this is new year's eve so i have to mm. ask Asia, um how do you mm. feel coming to the end of 2020 what's it been mm. like for you <laughs> <laughs> what a what an incredible year mm. i mean in a funny way we've been all you know stuck in this i think feeling of the everlasting day <laughs> you know the kind of groundhog day type thing or the day yeah. that's not changing and you know if you're like most people in the world you're probably in a pretty small space <laughs> which is where you kind of spend almost all your time <laughs> and um you know you're staring out the window for the kind of 300th time and you're like well yes there is still that tree there although it looks a bit different now and actually i mean saying that uh it sounds like a you know um actually yeah staring out the window at the tree um i have to say the thing that i've appreciated um the most about this year is we i think just in general as a society we were running around like chickens with our heads cut off mm. um just on mass you know um uh busy busy here and there and just running from place to place and you know i i work in academia but you're you know always going to a conference here or going there to do an examination or going there to do a talk or you know running back and forth between buildings and you're doing your tutorials here in the lecture there and it just felt insane actually yeah. so i appreciated slowing down um really spending i'm in lockdown with my husband jer um you know really spending that much time with someone you know getting that kind of you know sense of family intimacy that I think is actually very hard to find these days um and then actually noticing the tree outside the window you know yeah. and really like actually how it changed all year and it went through an amazing kind of journey mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um I think the thing is is that when you start to really slow down and see those things you realize how fundamental they are to our well-being and our sense of identity and feeling connected with where we live and that this has all been going on around us but like you say we've kind of been running around like headless chickens most people i think probably did did feel that huge change that huge shift that you're talking about i mean i certainly did i mean it was a real relief for me mm. a real relief it was like oh god i'm so exhausted i'm so exhausted but then um, but how about um, 2021, Gassia? What do you think you... Have you got any New Year's resolutions? Have you got any plans Ooh. that you're really excited about? I've never resolved. <laughs> <laughs> I've never resolved to anything. Um, yeah. Because A, I know it's just almost like a form of self-punishment when you yes. set a goal that is not uh really feasible you know mm -hmm. it's kind of like those times when you're like i'm gonna plan out my whole day and here's the schedule from hour to hour you know and it's going to be exactly like this it never works um <laughs> so what is the yeah. point so the only time i ever had a new new year's resolution was to sleep more and to, yes. to sleep better you know and, i think i remember yeah. that 
Was that a while ago? <laughs> it's a repeated one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I haven't mastered that yet mm -hmm. at all. And um, yeah, but actually, if I if I could do little things, I think you know we're able to change habits in small ways. So yeah, if, if I could make little gains in sleeping a bit better, I'd be really happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Ooh, yeah um oh well I've I have got one which I'm really excited about actually which is that I'm now going to block off holiday time which I know sounds really basic it's just I think especially when you are freelancing mm -hmm. and you don't have an employer as such and you don't have a boss and you don't have an allocation of holiday then mm -hmm. you have to be organized about mm -hmm. that basically mm -hmm. and um and I haven't always been you know very mm -hmm. good about that so it's what, really smart yeah yeah I think that this year I I just I mean I've done a whole um podcast uh, that next week's podcast episode from this one will be all about kind of setting uh like goals I guess for 2021 mm -hmm. for you, you as an individual musician but something that I definitely learned this year was how um how little time I was taking off you know and that yeah. Yeah. actually being at home I think fun in a funny way being at home really showed that to me because I was at home so much but I was still really exhausted and stressed mm. and busy and running around doing all these different things so I um and wearing all these different hats you know there'd be one hour I'd be auditioning someone for an MA course the next hour I'd be supervising a student the next hour I'd be you know scheduling out my social media for the next two weeks and then the next hour yeah. I'd be yeah. I don't know like, yeah and, just you yeah. just feel like you forget well you, your brain just feels like it's going to dribble out of your ears you know mm. and um and so I I kind of looked back on mm. by that time it was August and I realized I'd only taken one week off oh. that whole year mm. and um and I so so I just decided then and there because I was really stressed I was really anxious actually and mm. I was really feeling my mental health was mm. suffering and I knew it was because I was exhausted and stressed and I just needed time off. So I then booked a holiday in the Peak mm. District in the November. Um, and I thought, you know, F it, if I don't have enough money, uh, we'll make it work. Or if I, I'll, I'll make my work work around this, I will yeah. plan for it. And it really was amazing. It was great. And um, so now I've booked two weeks off, you know, in my head. Like, I don't have to book any this sure, off sure. with anyone. Like, it's all in my yeah. head. But I booked two weeks off from, you know, with I've agreed that with myself um, for Christmas. And so I'm getting all of my work prepared great. for that. Great. great. But I'm always going to, I'm also going to book off all of my time off for the whole year in like mm. the next couple of weeks I'm going to sit down with I my boyfriend you like you're going to book holidays yeah. over the, yeah and, I, and I'm going to book year off no no <laughs> I'm teasing yeah. <laughs> not the whole year <laughs> no but it's similar it to something you said in your episode one I think which was when you were working in London after uh your first kind of years of university mm -hmm. and you decided to go from the five-day work week to the four day work week which was still paying the same as the mm -hmm. five day work week and then you had that extra day to kind yeah. of you know um put towards the things you were passionate about mm -hmm. um and yeah it's important and actually I would say the people who I know who are like you know really hardcore basically they guard their holidays yeah. um closely you know yeah. or they guard them fiercely no it's and really important yeah, I'm, I'm working full time actually on a research project right now. So um, I'm not actually teaching, although I do love teaching, but it was the pace and it was the um, just how much longer actually it can take to prepare video recordings of yeah. lectures and get them, you know, every slide kind of perfect, which is different from when you give a live class because you can improvise a bit. Uh, but yeah, I found it, you know, with video recordings of lectures there's nothing coming back <laughs> you know you're just <laughs> you know dropping something into a yeah. virtual thing and yeah no yeah. it's been interesting for sure um okay cool well well what i would love you to do actually gassia is before we go in any further is could you please introduce yourself so sure <laughs> who is gassia ozunian yes thank you for saying my name so well um <laughs> yes um well i'm uh violinist professor of music um i teach at university of oxford now i've been there for four years 
previously, I worked at Queen's University Belfast, um, and that's where we met. Um, but I mean, I say I'm a violinist. I haven't been professionally actually playing for a while, but that's how I got into music. I studied violin. I studied music technology. I did a degree when I was an undergrad in the 90s in this course um, called Computer Applications in Music that was at McGill University. It was an incredible course, actually, um, really, really rich and varied. And you took courses in acoustics and you took courses in computer science, like in the computer science faculty. And it was a bit intimidating, you know, mm. because you were with all these computer scientists. And I took a course on AI at the time, you know, artificial intelligence. And the person who's like chess player got the most, you know, points, got the best grades. And so, you know, yeah. it was kind of the competition was kind of on and it was a bit intense and there were courses in math and things like that. But I also loved it. Um, and the kind of more music tech kind of stuff. So like digital signal processing, electronic music. And we actually had uh, something where it was, um, you know, analog techniques mm. and then digital, you know, so we did tape reel to reel and cutting wow. and tape and stuff like that. Wow, and, that's really cool. You know, and yeah, it was really fun. Um, yeah, I felt very, very lucky. That was in, yeah, McGill, Montreal. And then I studied uh, at the University of California in San Diego for my PhD. Um, and there, the program was called Critical Studies and Experimental Practices, which I didn't really know what it was <laughs> when I went out there. I just, I visited, I really loved meeting um the people there so the person who became my one of my supervisors george lewis he's a kind of you know pioneer of um artificial intelligence in music and he has this improvising system called voyager but he's also thinking really critically about race and um you know uh yeah, race and music and electronic music and contemporary music. I loved contemporary music. That's kind of where I found my home. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I kind of got into it from there. And and then I, uh, for my PhD, I was writing about sound art, the history of sound installation art, which was just something I was very interested in when I would go to visit museums and see these kinds of sound works but they seem to be something different than music you know and I was like what is the history of this tradition and there was very little writing on sound art at the time so you know it was kind of starting from a just looking at what artists had written and kind of going to museums and looking through their archives and things like that um and now it's like a much bigger I think you know uh field there's um incredible research it's kind of much broader all over the world I think there are really incredible artists. Um, that's why I, I write about sound art. I um, have a label called Optophono that publishes uh, interactive music and sound art. Um, I have a research group, which is looking at urban sound. That's kind of one of my uh, passion topics these days. Mm -hmm. um, and that's called Recomposing the City. So it's looking at kind of sound art in urban spaces, but also many aspects of you know, listening to urban life, um, whether it's human life or non-human, listening to kind of vibrational architectures or listening to elect the electromagnetic city and things like that. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the overview, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a, I guess mostly I'm an academic um, mm. and yeah, kind of working in contemporary music, sound art, experimental music, electronic music, that kind of thing. Wonderful. And am I allowed to say that you have a book on its way? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> how, how did I forget? Well, I, I was like, stop the list. It sounds very uh, listy. No, it's, well, no, it's I, I really interesting. You, a, you know, a 15 year overview, of course. Yeah. Um, I have a book coming out very soon. It is available to pre order already. <laughs> it's called um, Stereophonica. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a made up word, <laughs> um, but it alludes to um, the idea that really we can think of many, many, many things in music as through this uh, lens of space, um, not just things that are in actual kind of two channel stereo, which is how people think of stereo. So it's mm -hmm. called Stereophonica Sound and Space in Science, Technology and the Arts. And it's being published by MIT Press, which was 
depressed that when I was an undergrad student, you know, when I would go to the bookstores that I loved and I loved MIT Press and especially because they do a lot in the sciences and in the arts, it's kind of at that intersection, the book, it's a history. So um, there's a lot of, you know, theoretical writing on sound and space. So, um, and I, I started kind of not getting lost in that writing, but kind of asking where do, where do these ideas come from, you know, and what are people talking about when they say spatial hearing or mm. this or that? And I wanted to kind of trace the history of those ideas, basically. Mm. So, you know, I go actually, I go into the 16th century and 17th century and things like that, but most mostly the book starts in the 19th century, mm. um, where they are for the first time, they're really systematically studying um, how it is that people sense sound spatially, mm -hmm. you know, so hearing the direction that sound is coming from or the distance of sound or, you know, where it is in relation to you. How do you, how is it that you hear spatially? And actually people thought the prevailing view in the 19th century was that the sense of hearing was not spatial, <laughs> you know? Really? So, really? Yes, yes, which was very surprising, wow. of course, to me. And today, you know, we have all of these kind of immersive audio technologies and yeah. Yeah. And today we know so much more about psychologically how important it is for us to have, um, the, well, how psychologically important hearing is for our sense of, you know, identity and positioning and, you know, relationship mm -hmm. in Absolutely. space and, and yes, with other that's people. Very true. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's kind of incredible. True. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, kind of looking at what kinds of experiments were they doing? These mm -hmm. scientists in like Germany, Italy, the United States, Japan, um, looking at, frankly, a lot of <laughs> scientific texts in other languages, which was the hardest, I think, in a way, part of the study was to kind of, um, you know, look at scientific writing in Italian or French and kind of think, what mm -hmm. were they doing? <laughs> and, you know, you're kind of writing about things that don't necessarily have a history written about them. So it just takes time. And, um, but it was also kind of the funnest part uh, yeah. for me was to kind of, you know, you find one thing that leads to another thing, they cite somebody or, you know, there's just a diagram of something or there's a photo of something. Mm -hmm. There was a whole chapter that I wrote because at one point, my uh, history and it, each chapter is kind of doing a deep dive into like a moment or a, and that moment can be 10 years, it can be one year, it can be 20 years, in which really kind of the thinking around sound and space changes. Um, so I'm not writing a history of spatial audio. No. But there is a chapter on kind of stereo reproduction mm -hmm. in the 30s and, you know, the early tests they're doing in that. And so there was stuff in the 19th century, there was, uh, things in the 1930s and uh one of my wonderful colleagues uh asked me yeah like what happened in between <laughs> between let's say 1910 which is kind of where some of it stopped and 1920 you know or 1920 1930 where they start doing kind of more um you know experiments with recording and reproducing sound and spatial audio and stereo and I I, I was like yeah I'm not sure well, obvious answer in retrospect, the First World War happened, mm -hmm. um, but actually a lot of um, science uh, around audition, but also around this kind of spatial sense of hearing really progressed during the First World War. Um, but I didn't know the history of that and it hadn't, it had not been written. And, but I was finding all of these, you know, images from the war of these listening apparatuses, you know, so... I remember you posting them. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you posting them as part of recomposing the city. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, yeah. So it would be kind of just finding some strange device. Sometimes people were literally sitting, you know, in these devices, uh, their heads kind of inside these, um, almost like headphones, early headphones, proto headphones. Um, but they're listening through these, um, what they call sound receivers, but they look like hexagons and they're, you know, 10 feet tall. And wow. um, there's, you know, 30 of them in a cluster and 
there's two men and they're both listening. And so what are they doing? <laughs> you know, what is that device? Well, it's called yeah. the Maria phone apparently. And it's, uh, you know, so then looking at the kind of scientific writings that then some of them become published in journals. Most of these people are, you know, physicists or they're doing other things in science, but then they do this during the, the mm -hmm. first world war. Anyhow, for me, that was the most kind of um, rewarding part of it was kind of trying to find pieces of a puzzle and mm. yeah, trying to kind of um, put those together uh, and hopefully it makes sense. Basically. Mm. Great. Well, I mean, I love, when, when does the book officially kind of come out? When is it officially re released? Yeah, um, it's released on February 18th. Okay, great. Well, maybe yeah. once the book's out, we could actually do an episode about this because oh, there's be so lovely. much there and it would be lovely to support the, the book's launch and Thank all that so stuff. So, yeah, I think um, that'd be really interesting because I'd love to dive in deeper um, with that because it's just fascinating. Like you say, you've kind of pieced together a history that maybe hasn't quite been written in such a comprehensive way before. So that's very exciting. And, and, you know, I will only say about what I've just said in case it made no sense <laughs> to anybody who's listening, because you're, you're not necessarily seeing those, you know, images. Yeah. Um, what they were doing during the First World War was they were trying to hear where airplanes were coming from, where they, when they couldn't see right. them, you know, yeah. or where is the submarine or where is that mining operation? Mm -hmm. So the spatial sense of hearing suddenly became mm -hmm. super important during the first world war. Mm -hmm. And it actually became a very big advantage um, to the allied army, you know, armies who um, actually did the most advances in that. And mm -hmm. they created these incredible machines for spatial audio, for spatial audition. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. 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 So, no, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? How, I mean, cause we're at a period of a, sort of similar right now where certain forms of research will have been halted, but other forms of research will have really, you know, thrived and mm. excelled far beyond what they mm. would have done otherwise. And I think, mm. you know, that's a really yeah. good example yeah. of where that's yeah. happened before that um, being able to locate things without being able to see them, in a war mm. situation is really important so if you can do that on a superhuman mm. level mm. then mm. you're going to have the advantage you know so it mm. makes sense that yeah. they would then invest money and time in that but mm. then obviously other other types of research into sound will have then get put on the back burner because they weren't important to the war effort no you're absolutely so. right and actually when you say superhuman sense that's what they were like oh you know we we had been told these kind of fantastical tales of people with these superhuman powers of hearing but then they were like building these machines you know and exactly it was this international level of cooperation scientists from all of these different countries which is happening now yeah. with the vaccine you know yeah. there you know this vaccine but they say that no vaccine has ever been made before in under four years well this is obviously a huge yeah. advance you know in that timeline it's so interesting well we're, we're definitely going to have to do a whole anyway, podcast yeah. <laughs> episode on that that's fascinating um, see i get excited <laughs> yeah no it's really cool and, and just before we finish up on your list of of gasset ozunian world you have just launched a website as well haven't you gasset is that for recomposing the city yeah um so yeah. that was a really fun project uh with this wonderful organization they're a charity um, who is actually looking at kind of the crafts of city making and they're called Teatro Mundi. Mm -hmm. And we partnered with them, my group, Recomposing the City and them. And we independently, so I've been collaborating with them for a while. We independently had like the same idea, which was we're interested in notation. So for example, in you know music, you have the kind of standard I'm calling it standard. It's only standard in certain cultural contexts, but the Western art music kind of staff notation system, or let's say guitar tablature, for example, a different kind of system. Um, so those kinds of notation systems, but what I was interested in, it was kind of graphic scores, you know, verbal scores, kind of conceptual art. Um, but, you know, when you have people like in, uh, in the 1960s, people like Cornelius Cardew in England who are drawing these beautiful scores but it just looks like you know 
many different circles on a page or you know circles and lines and there's so many of these actually that are uh, being produced at that time and it's really kind of expanding the language of music and you're not any longer kind of just looking at a page and doing this kind of this known on a page and doing this kind of one-to-one -one interpretation but there's much more openness um it's much more sometimes the performer making choices or performers kind of making choices interdependencies before between performers so we were interested in these kinds of like really interesting graphic scores and when i say verbal scores it's like a text score an instruction score you have scores like yoko ono she says you know her voice piece for soprano is just scream against the wind against the wall against the sky you know these interesting scores and we thought well i'm interested in urbanism cities and so are they and we thought what if we got together a group of architects and urban designers and urban planners um, and look at scoring methods in architecture um, but through this kind of experimental lens mm. so normally you know they have these blueprints and the blueprint is this kind of one-to-one -one device you have to execute exactly what's kind of on the page or the yeah and so what would happen if an architectural plan, you know, a urban plan and architectural design was this kind of improvisational, open graphic kind of system? Um, so we did these kind of, um, so we had these different workshops in different cities. People came, architects came. We didn't, we really didn't know how it would go, <laughs> you know, like what, what is actually gonna come out of it um, or how would people respond? But we looked at some of these uh, visual scores in music, and uh, then we looked at a kind of site uh, in Belfast. We went to Sailor Town. We thought that's a very interesting site. It's a site that, you know, has a very interesting history. Uh, people have been displaced. Um, it's being regenerated. There's elements of the past. However, that kind of seep into the present. Okay, so if you were going to score for that site as an architect, what score would you create? after kind of thinking about this all day and looking at methods and improv and people created beautiful scores. And mm. it, so the project is called scoring the city. And um, so all these architects kind of then made uh, scores for, you know, some of them Belfast, some of them Paris, some of them Beirut. Each one is kind of looking at different conditions in that city and that site, uh, maybe a neighborhood, maybe a street, but kind of thinking about yeah, like a different form of expression in urban design. And Wonderful. it was really fun. And they're beautiful. They're beautiful scores. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we'll definitely link to the website in the show notes. Because I'm mm -hmm. sure people will be fascinated by that. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so, Gassia, um, I thought this, you know, special New Year's Eve podcast episode, that it would be nice to maybe go back through time and honour some of those women who have paved the way for us. Mm. And, um, and I couldn't think of anyone better to pick the brains of than you to just think, who are these women that we should not forget, that we should honour, that we should maybe just kind of raise a glass to this New Year's mm, Eve? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Heroes. Yeah. Yes. Um, heroines. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Let's have a non-gender yeah. specific <laughs> term. Um, badasses. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, there are, I think, you know, the thing when you kind of uh, look at the history of electronic music, for example, you realize there have always been women there. Mm -hmm. They just were not, you know, as celebrated, as recognized, as written about. We're lucky that we're looking at it today, though, because we have more things being published. We have their archives being found. We have, and actually it opens up, I think, a whole other world of thinking, you know, about music. So there's women like Marianne Amache. She's born in the 1930s. She's American. I think she has one of the most interesting original conceptions of music, <laughs> okay? She's thinking of sound in a very different way as airborne sound versus structure-born sound. And she starts creating music that's literally kind of shaking buildings and going through buildings. And it's the way it feels in the room. And it's very forceful too. Wow. She has, she almost wants it to like push you against the wall or like out of the end. She's thinking about these dramatic forms that she's creating, um, you know, using an architecturally scaled. Um, and she's doing that in the 
you know, 1960s and 1970s. Her first like work of architectural scale was in the um, 1970s uh, or, or 1980. It was called Living Sound Patent Pending. And then she had these pieces called Sound Joined Rooms. And she had this whole concept of odd joined rooms. So rooms joined through sound and hearing. And so mm. you would, you know, go through the space and um, how you navigated it and, you know, how you interacted with all the different elements. And she was always telling a story, but it wasn't necessarily in verbal, you know, it was mm. uh, through kind of... Um, almost like psychoacoustic experiences, you know, wow. sometimes like startling sounds. But, you know, she was also thinking about that decades before. She just Yeah, I mean, that's going to say have... so ahead of her time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there must have been hardly anyone else it doing is. It's sound installation. No. It, you're right. And it is yeah. sound installation. And I'm uh, unfortunately guilty of, like many people, having always traced the history of sound installation art to, for example, Max Newhouse. He's an uh, American percussionist who also creates these forms that are installations, so like sculpture. So it's not a musical work. It doesn't have a beginning or end. It's placed in a space. Um, it's sound placed in space. And he says, you know, I coined the term sound installation art. Well, he might have coined it, but you know what? He wasn't the first person doing it. Yeah. We know that anyway, because there were people like Varez, uh, you know, also male composers doing it, um, you know, installations in the 1950s. But guess what? Max Newhouse was exhibiting some of his first installations at Marianne Amache's festivals. Wow. <laughs> okay. But doesn't actually say that. Um, and so then when you then look into that history and you say, think, why does he never mention that, you know, mm -hmm. or that he collaborated on, he did the installation part of this kind of larger, um, you know, project by Alison Knowles called mm -hmm. House of Dust. Um, and it's this kind of computer-based poetry and it has uh, also, you know, sonic elements and these, you know, many different kind of multimedia elements. Well, the guys aren't saying it. <laughs> and then it's kind of their story, which is kind of being told. So we think of sound installation, we think of Max Newhouse, but we should be thinking about Marianne Amache, mm. who, yeah, who is also theorizing this stuff, you know, and kind of coming up with original compositional, you know, philosophies. Um, yeah. So she's one, I think, really interesting person. She doesn't, uh, published a whole, a huge number of CDs um, because you have to kind of experience it in the space. But she does have one CD that you can find and it's called Sound Characters Making the Third Ear. And in that, she's actually uh, exploring this other psychoacoustic phenomenon. And by that, I just mean kind of the psychology of hearing. She's testing ideas like how do we, you know, experience sound if you do this, if you do that, if you do that, how can you she was creating these things which we now call auto OTO, auto acoustic emissions. Mm -hmm. And that means you're hearing tones coming out of your ears. Okay. It sounds right. like your yeah. ears themselves are producing music. Mm -hmm. And she called them ear tones. Mm -hmm. Well, her music creates ear tones. Wow. And it's this almost uh yeah, totally startling, shocking thing when you experience it. And you're like, what the hell? My my ears are making music. Um, they're actually making like patterns, they fit rhythmically with like the other sounds you're hearing. And it's this wow. bizarre experience. And um, so people can check that out. Um, yes, yeah, that's incredible. So where was she based? Where was she living when she was doing all this? She's American uh -huh. um, and she lived in different places. Um, she lived in Boston. Um, I would have to kind of look at her bio. Uh, I think she lived in Philadelphia, but I don't want to get that wrong. Um, she, but she um, also lived in Philadelphia, I should say. But I, yeah. Um, but yeah, American and kind of exhibiting actually all over the States um, wow. and even all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was just this year that there was a collection of her writings and interviews and her own like letters, um, mm. you know, things that we just have never seen before that were yeah. her archives and they've now been published. Well, for somebody like me, but really for anybody who's in, for anyone who's interested, you don't have to be a, you know, kind of historian of music or something like that. But it's like so fascinating and mm. it's so valuable. Um, yeah. And so there is now, yeah, a, a book and actually two volumes on her and her writings and 
she has so many interesting ideas. She's thinking about sonic telepresence. Um, what so, is sonic telepresence? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, to put it maybe in crude, crude terms now, it would be almost kind of like networked sound, but she's kind of putting microphones and continuously transmitting sound from one place to another. But so for example, she continuously transmits sound for a period of three years <laughs> from the Boston Harbor to her studio, for example. Wow. But then she creates, yeah, she creates these because what she says is she not only wants to create, you know, sound works for entire architectural buildings and forms, but she wants to span multiple spaces, places, even countries, different cities. <laughs> um, so she creates like city links as a sonic telepresence mm -hmm. uh, work. And what she's doing is she's saying, you know, the sounds that are happening over there, they're also influencing, you know, kind of what's happening in this other space. And so she's composing for that kind of connection between spaces across, mm. play, you know, at wide, uh, large distances, at, at vast distances. Um, Again, really ahead of her time, because, really you know, ahead of her time. people, you know, the last kind of two decades have been doing that and fascinated mm. by it. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's nothing and, and new. Maybe even doing it in sometimes less interesting ways because, yes, now it's kind of so easy. Okay, I can mm -hmm. play work music with you here or me there, mm -hmm. whatever. But, you know, she's she's really thinking about it as like, how does this change music if we mm -hmm. think about it as an architectural phenomenon mm -hmm. or as we think about it as, you know, a way of connecting um, multiple spaces? And I think that's amazing. Yeah, um, it is. Wow, great. Okay. Um, so she's one. <laughs> yeah, she's one. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> she's one. Um, if we're thinking about, you know, uh, heroines of um, that we should drink a uh, raise a glass to, I would say, um, especially in the British context, but really global, Daphne Oram. She's mm -hmm. a, yeah. Um, you know, she is uh, working for the BBC. She's a composer. She's born in nineteen thirty. I'd have to look up her dates, um, but uh, and and actually dies I think not too long ago in um, 2003. Mm. But she uh, she helps to found the first kind of electronic music um, studio at the BBC, the B BBC Radiophonic Studio, which she only kind of sticks around there for a year. By the way, she establishes it, but then she leaves because she wants to have kind of full freedom to do exactly what she wants mm -hmm. you know and her you know bring forward her compositional aesthetic and not only make basically uh she didn't want to only make you know kind of sounds for tv programs and things like that yeah which is more what the bbc wanted um so she she sets up her own studio her own kind of electronic music studio um i'd have to look up the date but it's very early um and she creates this system of what she calls sound drawings um or a mix mm. have you seen this stuff as well yes um, i have yeah. yeah yeah it's amazing isn't it yeah um sorry she's born in 1825 um and uh yeah so then this kind of oramics it's for for anyone who hasn't kind of seen it i would i would recommend looking you know at there are videos of it online because it's something that um actually kind of it's nice to see it in motion but she's drawing kind of sound shapes on a film mm -hmm. and there's a machine that can read those shapes and turn those into audio mm -hmm. um and so it's a whole other kind of again way of not just notating but thinking about um what is this sound that looks like that you mm -hmm. know sounds like or you know how can i combine things in different ways but yeah. nobody was nobody was doing that. Mm. Nobody was doing that. Mm. So she's another kind of, I think, total original. But there's yeah. a film by um, a wonderful artist, and that's what I wanted to look up. Her, her name is Aura Satz, A-U-R-A-S-A-T-Z. She's based in London. She's a visual artist who has been making films, installations, um, interactive work about women in electronic music and she has a beautiful film about Daphne right. and it's called Oramics Atlantis Anew 
So she has a kind of um, excerpt of that on her Vimeo. So or a sats and on a remix. So uh, yeah, I think uh, Daphne Orm, she also, by the way, publishes a lot and again, has these very original mm. musical philosophies. So that's great. I've never read any of her writing, actually. I should do that. She's, she's wonderful. She has, um, you know, she's, she's also thinking very deeply, you know, about these mm. things because this is also quite early in the age of, let's say, electroacoustics. So they're thinking about, you know, what is it that, you know, what, what will this do to our minds and memory? And mm. when you're making music with capacitors and transmitters and, um, you know, what does this mean <laughs> yeah. for culture? So, you know, she has, she's a visionary, I would mm. say, you know, because she's, yeah. she, she, she's looking through something that is hardly there yet. Yeah. And, yeah, and shaping it as she goes through it. And, you know, for me that she has this kind of, in a sense, integrity that she had actually a job weird, you know, for a woman, especially mm -hmm. at the time, um, uh, you know, at the BBC, um, the, the radio phonics studio, um, uh, which was in 1958, but she leaves that to kind of do this on her own and to, you know, run her own studio because she doesn't want to compromise yeah and i think that's incredible um yeah and she is she's also a mathematician and electrical engineer and you know again quite rare for mm. um let's say somebody of that period uh to have that kind of training yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah and, and an interesting time as well like, an exciting time like you say because you know, we'd, we'd kind of, we were moving past just being able to capture sound and people were actually being able to sculpt sound. Yes. So, you know, you, the possibilities were really opening up, weren't they? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And it's this time in the 1950s and 1960s of, you know, vast kind of experimentation because as you said, okay, so there's um, early forms of sound recording, um, that's getting better, that's improving. And then of course they also have, you know, radio broadcasts, different forms of uh, reproduction, broadcasting. Okay, but then, you know, what do you do with these technologies <laughs> um, in a kind of compositional, musical way? How does that change compositional aesthetics, musical aesthetics? And again, the story we often tell is, you know, about these men like Pierre Schaeffer, who's at the Group de Recherche Musicale, which is this um, group that he founds at a kind of sister studio in a French radio station um, around this time in the 1950s. Um, and actually she visits there and she, you know, uh, you know, so they're all in touch. Um, there's also a famous studio in Cologne, who, which is often associated with Strauss and Karl Heinz Strauss. And so we often tell this story about, you know, sculpting sound and you know, then what do you do with these through the lens of what these men are doing? Um, but yeah, so yes, and it's not to detract from their ideas, their work. They also have very interesting, yeah. you know, new philosophies. They're testing things, doing things. Although sometimes they, you know, some of them take a quite, you know, uh, exclusionary, I would say, almost approach. Mm -hmm. Like there's only one right way and it's mm -hmm. my philosophy and I'm the head of the studio and you know there is that as well yeah um, yeah whereas i find her um approach is just it is really in the service of uh you know the art and the science the yeah. that she is wanting to discover you know and there's this incredible openness actually mm. um and it's it's not about kind of establishing that um and mm. and yet we also have to recover her name, those names, their voices, you know, when we tell these histories, because they're just as, if not much more, I think. Frankly, yeah. Yeah. Actually, well, yeah. The, the, I, I want to talk about that, but I want, I want to, the, the kind of interest, the more interesting idea there, because it's something that I think about a lot too, but mm. uh, maybe once we've kind of heard about a few other yeah, yeah. ladies, the other ladies well, you've got. <laughs> sure. Um, I don't know how many you've got, Gassi. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking, you know, having just said something about Pierre Schaeffer. Mm. So Pierre Schaeffer is um, a French composer who's associated with what he calls and becomes known as musique concrète, uh, concrete music. Um, and it basically means 
music made from recorded sound. So, but what they were doing was kind of uh, initially on phonographic uh, kind of records and then on tape, um, you know, recording the sound of the train, for example, but saying, when we play it in this composition, it is, you are not supposed to hear at a train sound. You are supposed to hear rhythms. You are supposed to hear textures. You're supposed to hear layers. And they did do that. And they built a whole kind of compositional philosophy around that. Well, but, you know, um, when you listen to music concrete, kind of part of this, you know, philosophy, what it produces too, is sometimes quite, uh, let's say, fragmented, disjointed, you know, uh, small motifs. It's, they're also limited by the technologies of the time. Mm. Um, but someone who, uh, you know, studies with Schaefer or is associated um, with him, but is a woman who is not celebrated until much later, and in a way is actually at first quite, you know, dismissed, is a wonderful French composer called Eliane Radig, R-A-D-I-G-U-E, um, who was born in 1932. And in a very, very, I mean, it couldn't be aesthetically more different. <laughs> and it also comes from her, you know, uh, life philosophy, her spirituality and her religion. She's a uh, Zen Buddhist. Um, and she creates these very, it's not just meditative, that's really a reduction, I would say. Um, long form works of um, very almost imperceptible, <laughs> changes um, yeah. in sound using this um, synthesizer that she has, you know, commissioned called the ARP 2500. It's this modular synthesizer. They're and it's also, massive, you know, isn't it? It's massive. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, and it's kind of custom. And she has these works, which um, she performs it. You know, the composition is like a recording of her performance of her composition. But again, it, instead of kind of taking little fragments of recorded sounds and making things out of what the, the music concrete guys were calling sound objects, she's creating a gesture, you know, that goes on not for 10 seconds or two seconds and is looped or whatever. It's going on for 40 minutes and it's all of her, you know, very extremely fine, uh, finely tuned, you know, tiny shifts that she's doing in this using the synthesizer yeah. to kind of do these yeah and so you almost can't hear that you've shifted sometimes from one kind of uh sound world to another because mm -hmm. it's so subtle if she even makes one um you know she loses her focus or she she makes a mistake or you know because it is also a kind of meditative practice she stops it and she starts again and so one composition might take one year wow. <laughs> you know, to execute yeah. and to realize. Um, but uh, when you, now we have, you know, the joy of being able to listen to some of mm -hmm. them. Um, and uh, so she has this, you know, uh, for example, people could listen to a series called Trilogie de la Mort, uh, Trilogy of the Dead, mm -hmm. um, Trilogy of Death. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and which and did she did she make that after her son died, or is that another piece, Cassia? Because in her son die in a car crash. The reason I know this is because she was um, there's a, a brilliant module that I taught on at BIM in London, and yeah, it was me. creative sound studies, and um and so there were a lot of people that I already knew, met maybe men, and then she came along into the you know whatever week we were on. And I'd never heard of her before and I'd never come across her music. And um, and I remember listening to the piece of music that was on the syllabus. Mm. And, um, and, you know, exactly like, you know, what you're talking about, these very, very long form drone pieces with, you know, indetectable shifts. And, mm. um, and, and it was so emotional. I was really surprised mm. by how much I enjoyed mm. listening to it. Because when you, when you say that, somebody's going to think, oh God, potentially might think, oh God, that sounds really boring. But it was really emotional, and um, and I think mm. the piece that I was listening to was from a a series which was in response to her son mm. dying in a car crash. Mm. Um, so I I don't know specifically with this work if it's inspired yeah. by that. Um, yeah. It's I, I think it's you know she's also referring to a Tibetan uh, book of the dead, mm. but might very well be might very well be. Um, mm. I actually met her one time in her. Um, 
uh, apartment in Paris and she's, yeah, um, just, yeah, a very human person. She actually, she did put her career essentially on hold to raise her children. Mm -hmm. And then she, yeah, continued um, kind of later in life. And it was only really maybe in the last 10 years, maybe 15 years that people are kind of appreciating yeah. um, her work. But that, 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 that's uh, very possibly true. I don't mm -hmm. know the timeline. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, three amazing women already mm. um we can stop there but if you have anyone else please sure. go for it um yeah i mean there are many interesting women i think in uh you know electronic music i would recommend there's a really great book by tara rogers called pink noises mm -hmm. um which is looking at you know female djs female composers female sound artists um you know, including some of the ones who I've mentioned, including Eliane Radik, she does interviews with them. So I would really recommend Pink Noises as a kind of book if someone wants to kind of start getting into the kind of the history of women in electronic music. One thing that Tara Rogers says, which I think, you know, really resonated uh, with me or that I thought was a very important point is that part of why, you know, women have been kind of traditionally excluded from these histories. So when I studied computer music, we definitely didn't encounter Marianne Amache, Eliane Radi, mm -hmm. Pauline Oliveros, Daphne mm -hmm. Oram, uh, Yoko Ono, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as she says, you know, composition has historically been gendered male. It's a, considered a male activity but also the avant-garde has been gendered male, but also electronics has been gendered male. So it's a kind of a, you know, she's, she's really looking at kind of composition and electronics being both these male domains. And so in order for, you know, people to make the leap, you know, and to uh, embrace the work of women, I mean, women were kind of doubly excluded, let's say. Yeah. Historically, you know, female composers, and even today, let's be honest, um, have, you know, a much higher, kind of um bar to pass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh yeah um and so and then when you combine that with also electronics um which is also kind of gendered male anything having to do with science and technology which is ironic actually if you think about the history of computers and how much women you know were con contributing there and as programmers as people who were actually well, building these circuits um, yeah i mean people may not know anything about this gassia but i mean i believe that it was a woman who invented the computer i think ada lovelace i think she wrote one yeah. of the first uh kind of computer programs basically um, yes yeah so be before there was kind of such a thing as a computer but it was almost yeah. like she was doing like the conceptual form of uh of that and um yeah so um but we don't again even even her name like maybe is better known now um yeah uh, absolutely yeah, yeah. but we, we associate you know computers with mm. you know a bunch mm. of guys basically mm. in silicon valley and this and that and the other um but also, and am i right know, in thinking that were building circuits as well and um yeah you know they were at the switchboards they were they were so mm -hmm. involved in the yeah. history of technology in, in different ways but maybe in some sometimes kind of uh their creative input or their kind mm -hmm. of authorial input was diminished you know or and you know with science you know sorry yeah no i'm just it's just just before we move on from that idea you know that vision um of that image of women kind of operating these computers um ada lovelace aside that it's that similar thing of oh well i'll come up with the idea as in the composition and then i'll get a woman to perform it mm -hmm. I mean, i'm really reducing that idea it's just you know. in my head i have this image of you know i've seen it in my head of during the war like the second world war especially of women operating computers of women operating and even building things mm -hmm. but it's very much almost on a factory line kind mm -hmm. of basis. yeah 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 you can perform this activity that i yeah. conceptually yeah. come up with yeah I think um, that's definitely uh, been a kind of a trope and uh, something kind of driving musical cultures. You know, the male composer and the female muse or the female performer, the female executant of mm. the male composer's brilliant ideas. Um, yeah. Sorry for the kind of thick sarcasm in my voice there, but sometimes it is boggles your mind because when you yeah. listen to what some of 
those female performers did, for example, Kathy Berberian. She's a very interesting vocalist who, if you listen to, you know, music by Luciano Berrio, John Cage, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, um, so many kind of big names of the 20th century avant-garde. It's her voice, but it's also her invention, you know, her vocal inventiveness and what she's able to do with her voice that they would not have been able to imagine much None, you know, much less notate or tell her what to do. I mean, yes, okay, but it's a collaboration. You yeah, know, yes, 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 they are doing something. She is doing something, but she's never kind of credited, you know, as a kind of collaborator or co creator or co author, even though none of some of these, you know, works would exist or have any meaning in a sense without her, you know, actual yeah. like original input. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and I think what's kind of what it's it strikes me that, you know, a lot of the time um women will be put in these roles of, you know, the performer or the person carrying out a functional task. And then you as a woman, then you have this pride of I do that task really well. Mm-hmm. I put I do that perfectly. I do that you know, um, I perform to a really, really good standard. I'm a, I'm a good girl. I'm like one of the, mm, mm, I, I'm yeah, a really high yeah. performing female. And, they you know? are, and they're incredible. And yeah. And then, but then it kind of makes me think about, um, you know, us as women now with technology, that I think we still have that attitude or that uh, mindset of, I have to do this right. I have to perform this mm. right. Mm. I have to do it flawlessly. Otherwise, mm. no one's going to value me or mm. take me seriously. I have to use music technology the right way and flawlessly. And how men tell me a lot mm. of the time, you know, or, or just how, you know, uh, the, the culture or the, the field Absolutely. tells me. And I think that, um, yeah, like bit by kind of reconnecting with these women from history, like we have been tonight. Um, I hope that it helps people to see that, you know, you, you can break away from that and you can really do things your own way. It kind of comes back to what we we're talking about right at the beginning of this call of, you know, forming your own path and forming mm. your own plan and, and also kind of connects to what you, you're doing with recomposing the city and scoring the city of, well, what happens if you, you write your own score? You know, mm. what happens if you do things differently and you don't just do what somebody else tells you to do yeah um so I, I just hope I, I love that Isabel yeah I love that because I think you you hit the nail on the head I think because um you know these women by necessity had to carve their own path they were never yeah. going to be embraced they were never going to be accepted they were never going to be given like the prestigious this that and the other and actually these were kind of already superstars in a way you know and the partly why we know them there are also many 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 other women whose names we don't know but who some of them were you know equally fascinating um these are the ones who have kind of broken through but yes they created their own paths because they weren't going to be um you know written about by all the critics and they weren't going to be you know published they weren't going to be yeah um you know in those history books almost uh I, I, I'm currently working on a piece in, on women in sound art in the 80s and 90s, and I'm looking at kind of books, uh, you know, Michael Nyman's experimental music. It's 200 pages long, and he doesn't mention one female composer. Okay, he the only woman he mentions in the discussion itself is Charlotte Mormon, who's this incredible cellist, but then it's only in the context of her collaboration with this uh, Namjoon Pike, who's also a wonderful artist, but like, you think, how, how, how could you yeah. write this kind of foundational text, you know, and not notice, not notice actually yeah. the women. Um, so they were car- carving their own path. And in a way, what happens, I think, is what they do is so much more interesting. Yeah, and so this, of- this is the conversation I really, I'm re- really glad we're having because it's something that I think about a lot. And it's something that I even think about when it comes to women I see, like my, my contemporaries and my friends and people I don't know, who are just putting out music and putting out art that I think, wow, that's, that's so interesting. Mm. And I don't mean, obviously, yeah, there's yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. men and there's yeah. lots of no, you know, people who think... are doing interesting things. But no, I but do think right. there's still that sense of like, well, this may or may not really be picked up in the way that it might be if I was a guy. And so, right. or, or and even, or even just 
there are not people like me Mm. like who look like me and sound like me and think like me necessarily Mm. who are who have done this in the past Mm. so you're not constantly feeling that pressure to live up to that Mm. you know that blueprint in the same way maybe I think there's pluses and minuses I think there is a real liberation as a woman in that you you do get this sense of well I'm going to do something different anyway because Mm. just me being up up on stage with whatever equipment I've got or whatever situation I've Mm -hmm. got performing I'm going to look a bit different in this room anyway like I'd certainly you know yeah we met at Sark which is a wonderful place. But, you know, I've said before that when I was doing my MA and I was doing my PhD, as a woman, you were very much in the minority. And you, you were gassier in the minority teach, as on the teaching staff being a woman anyway. So just being in the room, you were already a different kind of energy, a different presence. So I do think that's liberating in a way because you're like, well, then I, I don't have to, you know, do what's already been done before. I can do something a bit left field, a bit weirder or a bit more you know just a bit different and um and I just I have to stress again this is not to take away from the amazing work and ideas that lots of men that I dearly love and know and also don't absolutely you know it's not to take away from that it's just that I can't help but notice that the women that you're mentioning from history other women that we could have mentioned obviously that Hildegard Vesterkamp like this Mm. is the time when I came across her work it Mm. really struck me the difference And uh, tell me why, because I, I, I kind of have a bit of a yeah. sense, because I think we've spoken about it a little bit, but why, why, and she, so she's a composer who's yeah. creating soundscape kind of yeah. composition. So she, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, you know, Gassi, but for anyone who doesn't listening, she came out with the World Soundscape Composition Group from Canada in Toronto in the 60s, 70s. And they were all very interested in how um, we might use sounds of our surroundings, predominantly natural sounds, because R. Murray Schaefer, who led this group, was very almost, I would say, almost kind of militant about how how much we we needed to value natural sounds and what he called natural sounds. Um, And but but. So there were lots of different composers that came out of that group, but Hildegard Westerkamp came out and Kitts Beach Soundwalk is, has kind of become a a bit of a trope now, I guess, in um, undergrad experimental music courses that gets wheeled out as... And and tell maybe people what a soundwalk is. Yeah. Yeah. So so a a soundwalk would be um, any kind of journey that you might make. And sometimes that's actually on foot, but sometimes that's just through using field recordings to take people through a route basically and soundscape composition would be using um the soundscapes of our surroundings as compositional material and so a lot of the time that's long form recordings of places and usually traditionally that's outside and and there's a lot of kind of contention there about what is natural what's what's human what's non-human what should we value more what is pollution what's noise pollution all that kind of stuff we won't go into that much but the reason why I mentioned Hildegard Westerkamp is because when I heard her piece, Kitts Beach, Sa- Kitts Beach Sandwalk, it's just so fascinating the way that she's so upfront about how she's manipulating, the way that mm. she's using those recordings, but mm. that she also puts herself right in the middle of it with her voice mm. and with her interpretations and her dreams and her thoughts and mm. the way that she relates to the sound. So it becomes so much more than just this really reductive idea of, I'm going to ca- purely capture the sound of a beach and she's very upfront and she says this is not me purely capturing the sound of the beach this is my interpretation and I have manipulated the recording in order to have this effect but I could do this and I could do that and I could EQ it in certain ways and it would make you think this or feel that and it reminds me of this and it reminds me of that and it it's just so there's something so kind of um especially for the time so radically bravely honest and so bravely kind of there's a vulnerability that she is not scared Mm. to show there which is yeah Uh, this is my interpretation this is not an accurate depiction of this place Mm. but that my interpretation is a neutral documentary of a sonic environment it's her engagement and she's in dialogue with it and she's listening and she's you know the sonic materials are kind of revealing themselves and she's engaging and she's describing and she's making it accessible yeah absolutely and and that we we're kidding ourselves if we believe that it's ever any different from that really you know, unless you are genuinely just using it as cold, hard data, 
it is, and especially if it's in any kind of art form, it's always through our filter. Of I agree with you, Isabel. Think, you know, I agree with you. And yet it's exactly this is, you know, one of these, again, kind of tropes in Western art music history, this almost um, macho kind of scientist stick kind of objectivism that starts to happen in music yeah. and so you know the soundscape composers who are just doing kind of pure documentary and I'm not inserting myself in this at all and first of all every choice you make is a choice mm -hmm. which is shaping this every you know that even the tools you use are biased you know yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know it almost becomes this way of asserting one's uh I did this extremely, you know, the best way. And there's like, it's like a shield and you can't penetrate that because they have, they have their system and they're sticking to it. Yeah. You know? And she completely undermined, she completely even maybe oh, transcends maybe. Yeah. Is, is more. Yeah. And she, she knows it's there. She's engaging with all these people, but she um, has so much more, again, an inclusive, I think, approach. Mm -hmm. And she has, um, but I know there's another part to your story, which is that you liked Kit's Beach Soundwalk and this, you know, work in which she inserts her voice and there's mm -hmm. a narrative and um, it's not this kind of objective, you know, recording, mm -hmm. but not all of your peers did. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've forgotten this now, Gassia, tell me, I've, I've, oh. I've got such a bad memory. It's so funny because I do remember you kind of saying to me that um, you know, we don't have to kind of get into the whole bit. I mm -hmm. kind of remember uh, you mentioning that, you know, someone really kind of was looking down on that, you know, and kind of saying, uh, you know, works that are narrative based or, you know. Oh, have yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Anyway. No, it's, I mean, well, and again, I think it's it's a big issue, isn't it, with contemporary art in general, just this real contempt for narrative well, and I think, again, there's a kind of gendered thing there because mm. there rationality yeah. is supposed to be the kind of highest, you mm -hmm. know, in this kind of male Western epistemology, you know, in that frame. Mm. And so then storytelling, oral traditions, you know, they're way down, you know, things yeah. about emotion, they're way down on yeah. that, you know. List. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's an ignorance about what narrative is as well. Mm. I think, you know, that that even you saying that, narrative art forms are not as I don't know I don't know what even the argument is but that they're yeah. not as good that's a narrative as well yeah. and yeah. the whole reason you think that is because of your narrative and right yeah totally, totally. you know so. yeah, they, they, they missed that part yeah. they missed that part when they were creating their kind of uh, philosophy they missed yeah that part. I know and which is you know partly why you're just kind of it's so kind of when you start to really critically examine those ideas mm. you're like what 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 were they thinking? <laughs> like, yeah. How, how did they miss this kind of very fundamental thing that's also shaping this? Yeah. Know, um, yeah. And um, I think actually, uh, you know, if I can name a few more interesting women, yeah. Laurie Anderson is a oh, wonderful, yeah. yeah, storyteller and mm. electronic musician and artist, and yeah. she does things with the vocoder and she's mm -hmm. creating persona and. And she does it with a lot of humor a lot of the time yeah. as well, which is really, yeah. again, quite unusual mm, for an experimental musician to be bringing in humor absolutely. and the way that they're using technology. And she does it so well. Totally. And again, I think that's kind of actually a, a subversive thing because, yeah. you know, she's amazing at what she does. Mm -hmm. You know, she's probably one of the most, at, you know, the most famous performance artist who yeah. comes out of the 70s and 80s and uh, still active today yeah. yes because yeah. you know in these kind of avant-garde circles which she's also in she's also in mainstream she has a very popular song oh superman it's like it's the top of the british charts type of thing mm -hmm. um but you know in these kind of avant-garde circles modernist circles this not the other it's everything is so you know sometimes taken too seriously and as long as, as soon as you kind of you know let your guard down you're no longer <laughs> kind of in in the in yeah. crowd so, yeah you know, I think it's so brilliant that she uses exactly she does mm -hmm. it with wit she does it with so much humor mm -hmm. uh yeah and joy you know playfulness yeah you know, those kinds of things which are, again, diminished. But why? Why? Because people enjoy them, actually. <laughs> why, yeah. why diminish them? Why? <laughs> um, just so we all think you're smart. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But yeah. what, what does anybody get out of that? It's not a kind of sharing mode. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, totally. There's, 
Hmm. There's a wonderful, um, also electronic musician artist called Christina Kubisch. Uh, mm. She's German, mm. and she also um, she has this very cool uh, kind of um, well, many things that she's done, but maybe the thing she's one of the things she's best known for. It's called the electromagnetic walks. You wear these special headphones uh, that audify. Um, sounds that you can't normally hear in your environment mm -hmm. because they're outside the range of human hearing, but they're in the electromagnetic frequency. So you walk by an ATM machine and you can hear all this kind of activity or on people's phones. And then, anyway, but she in the uh, 1970s is creating these beautiful, funny pieces, okay, which she has this whole series called Vibrations and she's using vibrators <laughs> and she's wow. actually putting them kind of on the string of the cello. You know, she has a, quartet for a uh, string quartets uh, a, a string quartet for um you know two violins cello viola like a normal string quartet plus four vibrators <laughs> and they have to be kind of sized specifically wow that's great um, yeah it's like a, a send-up you know yeah. of like 1960s drone music yeah. Acoustic. yeah so she's kind of subverting again those traditions with like a lot of wit and humor she mm -hmm. has these things called uh, a series she does called emergency um flute solos which uh she's playing the flute but she's wearing a boxing gloves you know or she's playing the flute <laughs> and she has symbols on all her fingers or again and it's funny it's funny yeah. and you look at those images and you look at but it's so smart and um, yeah, yeah. And she's not afraid to be funny. And I think that's an interesting one, isn't it? Kind of using humor and it's definitely something that I would, you know, that I would want to explore in the future. Definitely is humor. You do, and... I think. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> you do and I love yeah. it. Yeah. And I think I'd like to go further and I'd like to do it with more of the experimental kind of string that I have to my bow. Definitely. Brilliant. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Because I think... I think there's something about, there's always something about humor that is about kind of delving into the nooks and crannies of our psyche that mm. we don't quite understand mm. or we, we use humor to go there. And I think that obviously, you know, electronic sound and music is a great tool mm. to, to enhance that maybe, mm. maybe. So I we'll see. That. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you can do so much, I think. Mm. And, and you do do. So mm. I'm, I'm really excited to kind of, <laughs> Yeah, because also in some of your videos, I think there there can be a humorous element. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I think I've yeah, I think I always or try maybe have... more recently with some of. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so yeah, no, it's really interesting thinking about that. Actually, I just wanted to touch on obviously, you know, this year has been incredible when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement. But just thinking Absolutely. more generally about how, um, yeah, I guess white Western culture has yeah. been taken for granted that that mm. is the 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 kind of most important culture let's say yeah. Yeah. um so so yeah where does that all stand with with um, women in electronic music it's interesting because again i think you know exclusions happen in many different ways they mm. happen around gender they happen around sexuality uh, they happen around race and mm -hmm. for example pamela z is an incredible um, composer, sound artist, vocalist, uh, who also uses humor, who uses technology, who is singing. She's classically trained as an opera singer. She's African American, and some of her work is dealing with kind of just the socio politics of voice. You know, why does your voice sound like this? You know, and what does that say about race, gender, class? You know, she has so many interesting works. Vokai is one of them. It's like an 80 minute, I would recommend, you know, people can find video clips and things like that, I think online. Um, but she, yeah, she uses many different tools to kind of manipulate the voice, but she's always telling a story. She's all, she's always kind of conveying kind of a larger meaning, you know, as well about why is it that we use the voice the way we do? Why is it that we think of vocal anatomy the way we do. What it, how is the voice a tool? You know, how does it, you know, how is it used to kind of classify people or, you know, with accents and things like that? She, you know, again, it, it's so interesting to think about, you know, an artist like her who wouldn't be creating those kinds of works necessarily had she, you know, not experienced those kinds of exclusions. Mm -hmm. You know, she wouldn't necessarily be thinking about the kind of, you know, sociopolitical kind of, dimension of the voice you yeah. know it's not like Luciano Berrio or someone who's like 
oh, oh I, I don't want to diminish any, actually. He, he's a very interesting composer, too. But, you know, it's not just about the beauty of the voice, or it's not just yeah. about the kind of aesthetics, it's, uh, you know, in that sense. Um, if she had not experienced those kinds of exclusions as a Black female avant-garde artist using technology, <laughs> it's like multiple, you know, barriers then. Um, she wouldn't necessarily be, you know, thinking in such in interesting, deep, new ways about yeah. what the voice is and kind of how to deploy that, you know, in art and music mm -hmm. and, you know, expose kind of this whole like range of expressive possibilities of the voice. And she's so cool. So, uh, yeah, I would recommend, um, you know, checking out Pamela Z. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful artist called Mendy Obadike who lives in New York City, who's um, a sound artist. She uh, creates a lot of work with her husband, Keith Obadike. So they're Mendy plus Keith. That's how they style themselves as one name, Mendy plus Keith Obadike. Um, and they also really look into kind of like race and kind of sonic codes. Um, they've done, m you know, many works uh, um, that people can check out. Things like audio walks. You get out in Times Square and you're kind of navigating using their app, but it's through the perspective of kind of African American histories and um, you know uh, sonic languages and what's kind of not seen, what's not heard in these kind of you know what you're saying, uh, Isabel, about these kind of dominant cultures, kind mm -hmm. of what we see, the story we tell about a place. They create these uh, stories, for example, they celebrate um, you know black poets and activists and authors, and they have a whole series, for example, where they. Um, have, have done sound works, for example, with the recordings of James Baldwin, and but it's going through a again a building and the windows and the they're revealing things that are there but that are hidden. Yeah. And again, I think that comes through their experience of they have had to you know learn different codes, different ways of communication. This also you know traces if you go all, all the way back, you know the way enslaved people were communicating has to do uh, with not necessarily being able to be un understood, you know, by the people who are imp oppressing them. So for them, you know, those kinds of like acoustic community, that means something very different in the context of their work, you know, and yeah. who understands and what they understand um, mm -hmm. about what they're hearing. It's not just a sonic signal. There isn't just the listener. There yeah. Are, yeah, there are people whose kind of social experiences, cultural experiences, those differences, you know, um, actually really shape what they hear, how they're able to hear and interpret, you know, mm. et cetera. So I think, yeah, um, you know, in the wake of, well, movement that should have never needed to have happened, Black mm. Lives Matter, um, but that, you know, thankfully brought attention to just basically the de continued dehumanization of Black people around the world. Mm. Um, Hopefully, in our different cultural, academic, in your world, media, I hope there's much more understanding, awareness of who's not there, you know, who's not at the table, who is not in our classes, classrooms, yeah. who is not, you know, we have many more women now in academia, but there are very few women of color. It's, yeah. it's shameful, I think, you know, if you think about how few female Black professors there are in the United yeah. Kingdom, it's, it, it is like a, it, it should be a point of massive embarrassment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a failure. It's a failure. It's just something that we have failed, let's say, as a culture and society to, mm -hmm. to do. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I just hope there's more awareness and actually action and people actually acting on uh, what they say they want to do in terms of inclusion, diversity, mm -hmm. these kind mm -hmm. of buzzwords. But what yeah. does that mean? How are you going to translate that, you know, into actually making it a workplace environment classroom, which everyone feels welcome, can see themselves in mm -hmm. um, and, and feels heard? Like I completely agree. And I think that um, I think it's impossible to get to a point where you've kind of you've done it all right. I think that what we absolutely have to do is all of us is like you say, be constantly asking that question. Who's not in the room right now? And um, and I think disabled artists, disabled musicians and um, people with disabilities in general. But, you know, when we think about a music context um, and a and a sound context, um, disability is just 
I, I don't think it's even considered most mm. of the time, to be quite frank. I think that um, it's even less than race. Yeah. I think gen- gender is one of those things that we're, we're kind of experiencing finally um, a, a real surge in support and people doing lots of interesting things around, you know, women and non-binary um, people in music. And it, it's not equal by any means, but there's a lot of a lot more efforts in that direction now. But I th- and then I think people are starting to think about race, you know, this year people are. But it's really because they have to because otherwise people will be really, really mm. offended and will publicly shame them. And But I think still disability is one of mm. those, um, is one of those ones that has not been even really considered. And it's it's near impossible to have a career. Oh, I don't want to say that and put somebody off who's listening. It's very, 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 very hard to have a career as, as an artist or as a musician and have a disability, mm. you know? Uh, 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 that's undoubtedly true and yeah. sadly sadly so um, yeah. because you're absolutely right there should be so much more attention to um, how to if we talk about inclusivity to really think about kind of um, you know a very vast range of uh, you know um, neurodiversity yeah oral diversity yeah. you know yeah. uh, different ways of hearing or um, deaf culture. Yeah. The wonderful sound artist, Christine Sun Kim, who is deaf herself and who mm. I think has created probably some of the most compelling, you know, sound work uh, related sound art, let's say in the last yeah. five years. Um, yeah. And physical, you know, disabilities or mm-hmm. different abilities. Yeah. Let's say. yeah. Um, and actually, I think women have again, possibly because of their, you know, own forms of experiencing exclusion been possibly a bit more attuned to, you know, that register. For example, Pauline Oliveros, who Mm -hmm. is another uh, hero who I didn't mention, um, who creates these sonic meditations, uh, exercises that people can do, um, her concept of deep listening, um, you know, to how to really pay attention to the sounds of, you know, your environment, but she is also creating, you know, instruments that can be played by anyone. It is part of a philosophy. It is part of a philosophy. It's all about kind of opening this world to, uh, so that it's not just for whoever has access, whoever had the educational opportunity. I wouldn't ever say, you know, intelligence. I don't think anyone, frankly, gets I don't think anyone gets into anything because of their intelligence. I think it's because they had the opportunity, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're right. And, and actually one, one other uh, woman, a scholar who I'll I'll mention who is really, I think a pioneer in thinking about disability and music and sound is Mara Mills. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if you look up some of her writing, um, yeah, she has been thinking about this um, and is, and and we'll have some books coming out soon. Um, Right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Gassia. I mean, oh. there's, you know, so much that we covered, but I mean, I just feel like we scratched the surface, mm. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. to do with like the women in history, but you and everything that we could have talked about beyond that even. So we'll definitely have to get you back on the podcast. Um, I'd especially love to. when your book's out. You. Yeah. Yes, I've you finished know. this massive wine glass. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've, I've gone through two glasses of <laughs> of fizz <laughs> i love it and i certainly shouldn't have any more um but yeah it was oh, really such nice a pleasure to... thank you thank you let's have a you know more conscious 2021 <laughs> yeah say. yeah and, and pay yeah. attention i mean what you're doing here too is you're helping people again find their own path see themselves in this world that they want to be in um yeah and and it is about kind of attention and consciousness being attuned to what your needs are what you want to do what your yeah what your ideas are and to bring that forward so I I really love that I think it's an incredible project so yeah I'd love to see yeah yeah okay actually just one really quick final question one really quick final question you've been a student you've been a performer you've been a composer you've been an academic and you've witnessed so many other women in that sphere as well what would you say is the biggest piece of advice you could give somebody listening to this podcast who is a female identifying 
musician of any kind um drawing on that time you spent in in this field what would you advise them well it's a musical metaphor i guess because what i would advise is amplify each other mm-hmm. because i think we sometimes live in worlds where artists musicians are somewhat guarded you know you think i have to do this i have to get that i have to share it you know if you see some even if it's something you want to go for share it um if you appreciate somebody tell people about them you know you don't lose yeah absolutely i think that's such good advice and i think um you're right that a lot of the time we can think that that's going to detract from my opportunities or the attention that i get all those kinds of things but in fact it's it's so much better in the long run you know you will have so many more opportunities that then we also really need to be good at doing that for ourselves yeah yeah be kind to oneself and you know think about what it is that you value about what you do <laughs> you know yeah. it's something that as women we're not really socialized to do <laughs> oh well thank you so much gassy it was so interesting Yay. and i could just Yay. talk for hours and um yeah like i say we'll have to do another episode about your book and i can't wait for that yeah so much okay that was a long one but a goodie i absolutely loved hearing gassia talk about all of those incredible pioneers of music technology and the ingenuity and bravery of their work i myself will certainly be taking some of that energy into what i do this year Remember, Gassia has an awesome sounding book, Stereophonica, coming out in February, which you can pre-order now from MIT Press. The link is in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to rate and review the podcast. It really does help us get in front of even more women and girls. And next week on Girls Twiddling Knobs, we're really going deep within, as we'll be looking back over 2020 drawing a line under the challenges we may have faced and getting ready to make some meaningful moves with our music that truly excite us in 2021. But for now, I've got a bottle of fizz to finish off, so I'll catch you in the next episode. Have a wonderful new year. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and, more importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.